Greetings, and welcome to another Deacon Macquarie original, Beatles Stuffology, where two old friends sit around and talk about BS, Beatles stuff, on a track-by-track -track basis, pretty much for the sake of it. My name is JG Macquarie, and I'm here with my co-host, Andrew Deacon. Say hi, Andrew. Hello. Are you ready for the song this week? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's Let's go for it. What you got for me this week? Good. Well, um, this week, you really got a hold on me. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, we can do that. That's not a problem. That's a fair enough song. Yeah. Excellent. Your, your enthusiasm is overwhelming. I don't like it, but I love it. <laughs> well, we can hardly argue with that. So yeah, this, this uh, week we are going to get stuck into a Smokey Robinson and the Miracles cover with You Really Got a Hold On Me. So, um... Yeah, how do you find this one? Hey, you know, um, I think I've probably mentioned before that um, there was a point, I think, early-ish, maybe mid-80s, maybe it's 83, 84, where um, BBC Radio 1 did a kind of like a documentary about some of the, the early Beatles years. Um, and in particular, sort of the more I think about it, I think it was it was more sort of linked with um, some of the, the, the rock songs that they covered. And this is definitely one of them. There's certain ones that I remember, like you know, Kansas City, um, and and you've really got a hold of me. That that was must have been some of the the earliest album tracks that I became aware of by the Beatles. So this one I think has lived with me for quite some time. And I think it also helped that there was um, um I don't know if you remember, but in the early eighties, Smokey Robinson had a had a big hit in the UK. It was like being with being with you, I think, mm -hmm. which was quite a, sort of a smooth song. But you know, it was it was kind of quite nice at the time. So the the, the two kind of dovetail together to then sort of just make you think, okay, right, there's something here that's pretty good, and and it is, it's it's pretty good. I I think it should open up a, a discussion at some point, perhaps when when we get close to the end of the album, um, about what actually is the Beatles' best cover version ever. Because I think you can certainly put this up there with Twist and Shout, and you know, I know there's a certain affinity for boys, but then also Money, as as being really, really strong um, contenders. What do you think? Um, I agree. What a surprise! Uh, no, I really, I really love this song. I I really love the song. I think this is a great version of it. I I don't know whether I want to say completely that it's. Better than the Smokey Robinson and the Miracles version, but I think it's as good at least as it. It's got a very different kind of feel to it. It's definitely got that, you know, Lennon is 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 not known for projecting fragility at this point in his career in the way that that Smokey Robinson does in the original. Um, you know, he's much more kind of impassioned, but it suits the song really well, and it's not a. Uh, it's not a melodramatic performance exactly, but it's got a lot of kind of drama in it. And I think I think Lennon does really, really well with the material as far as the vocals are concerned. Everybody is really on top of the game, though, and you can just tell that they are invested in this song. It really seems to matter to them that they turn out a great version of it. And, you know, we've talked about quite a few cover versions at this point in the podcast, but it's interesting to, to come to one where you suddenly get this kind of spark in it where there's a real attempt to uh to put you know heart and soul into into their version of it i i really really rate this yeah well it's it's one of those the songs that sort of lyrically i think fits in with some of those other things um that, that lennon's been singing about there's that that you know like i can't live without you i can't live with you kind of feel to it that that sense that someone has a power over them and there's almost that kind of pleading. Um, and, and that snarl, it does get a good snarl across in this that somehow manages manages to encapsulate both strength and vulnerability. Sorry, I got a bit pretentious there. I couldn't help myself. <laughs> um, it, it really works. Um, you know, you, you just sort of get a sense of someone who is desperate to project both uh, that sort of traditional masculinity um, in terms of that sort of desire, but also that sense of vulnerability, um, which you know, is, is kind of unusual. And, you know, sort of talking about it in that way, because, yes, the lyrics are the lyrics are perfectly fine, but there's something in the way that he delivers them that makes them more so. You know, it is something that he brings to the song, because the, 
you know, the, the original version has that sort of soulful, heartfelt feel, but it doesn't quite have the range of emotion that this one has. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that kind of that lyrical kind of uh, dichotomy, if you want to put it that way, sure. um, yeah. you know, sort of <laughs> uh, badly, madly, wrong, strong, you know, want, need, all that kind of stuff. Like that, th those are fairly simple lyrics, but they're ones which it's obviously clear that that Lennon is able to really invest in. And I'm, I'm not going to get too psychoanalytical about it, but, you know, he, you know, his life is riven with those kind of contrasts and conflicts and and i can imagine that that is something he was well able to kind of invest in but i can also imagine that it's a lyric that he could probably it, it probably seemed achievable it probably seemed in 1963 1964 like the kind of song that they could write it's not complex in 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 a lyrical sense and certainly nothing like as complex as they're going to go on to write but taking that kind of sort of fairly straightforward dichotomy um, I mean, you'll see something similar, I suppose, in Rain, where you have yeah, the sun and the rain are being contrasted in precisely the same way that you have with this. So it is kind of something that Lenin will also go on to write as well. Um, but yeah, I think that gives him something that he can really invest in. And, you know, we've talked in the podcast before, you said that you're not the biggest fan of, of Lenin's voice, but you, you feel that it kind of really works in this one? Yeah, absolutely. It does. Yeah. And uh, OK, so I, I think my reasons, uh, I, I not trying to to you know go against the prevailing orthodoxy but when you know so many people might say oh yeah he's a really great rock singer my tendency is always then to go okay well is that true let's let's sort of have a thing let's have a look and and then to try and come to my own judgment rather than just to go along and 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 there have been times when when you know i've not particularly enjoyed that sort of sneer uh that sort of nasal aspect um that, that he can sometimes bring uh, or perhaps I, I don't quite see why everybody is is fawning in the way that they are but that's fine on this it, it definitely works and, and, and just to go back to, to the lyrics and I think it's a really good indication isn't it that, that sometimes simplicity just works and you know okay I'm I'm all too willing to take the mick out of the, the Noel Gallagher school of moon spoon swoon uh, type lyric writing but there are times when even for Noel Gallagher especially in the first two albums it works so you know it, it's not just about the lyrics it's it's about the performance it's about the craftsmanship it's about the the production and and I'll, I'll return to you know a point I've made you know before to me actually there's there is a point where if I'm not really listening to the lyrics it's not a bad thing. It means that everything else is working. You know, I, I'm invested enough in the song for me just to pick up, you know, a few key words here and there, hum it along. I'm not going to go in and, and then suddenly start reading the, the whole lyrics. It's just if something jars with everything else, if something throws me out of, of being with that song, that I'm then going to start, you know, looking at it more closely and, and starting to wonder, yeah, what was that person thinking on that day? So I don't mind the, the simplicity of it because they really rock it in the studio for want of a better expression. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think it's an interesting contrast to have um, George Harrison um, doing the other lead line rather than McCartney. It also gives the song a slightly different feel to it as well. And that, that makes it stand out a bit. You know, Harrison has that slightly more gentle voice or, or thin if you're feeling uh, a little bit more critical um but that also kind of lines it up a little bit with the smoky robinson version there is that little hint of kind of fragility or, or or yearningness which which is being contrasted against sort of lennon's much more kind of intense lead vocal um that works really well for the song as well and again like you know harrison isn't necessarily the the, the strongest singer of the group i think that's probably an uncontroversial statement but it's another one where they've clearly arranged the song around who's best for it because traditionally you would expect either like a three-part close harmony there mccartney is harmonizing as well but you would expect him to take kind of the other lead rather than harrison but it, it works here precisely because they've chosen the voice that works better for it rather than just the bog standard setup and that again to me kind of speaks to the attention to detail which is being put into the recording here it, it's it's something that they're actively paying attention for they're not falling back on just like their standard tropes or we can do this or whatever and that works and so for also another point which i 
I thought this was a minor point, but actually, the more I think about it, I the more I think it's one of the things that makes a difference. This is slightly lower than the Smokey Robinson version as well. There's a uh, there's also a uh, Percy Sledge did a cover of this as well, which is essentially identical to the the, the Miracles version, um, and it's in the same. Uh, I think it's in the same key or it's so close as that I can't tell the difference. Um, but the Beatles version is noticeably lower and that does change it. It does give it a slightly different emphasis. And I think it's one, again, that sort of really helps uh, to reinforce kind of Lennon's voice on the track. Um, but it, it, it makes it distinctive from the original. It gives it a different kind of timbre, a different feel to it. Um, and that works really, really effectively as well. So that's quite interesting because I, I was looking at um, a performance from 1964 by Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, uh, which looks like it's from a from a TV special. Uh, certainly, once the song ends, they don't automatically then sort of move to go off stage. It looks like they're about to go into another number, um, and it starts with Smokey Robinson with the Miracles behind him, and including one person on guitar. And I think there's either three i think there's three backing singers and as smoke robson starts singing one of them comes forward to the second microphone and is singing the harmony part whilst the others are at the back you know clapping away and moving and 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 dancing um and the the harmony is quite similar um to the beatles but that isolating it so that not everybody is involved I think is is an important thing. It's it is as you say picking the right people for for the job, and and I think that the fact that that George, um, well bless him, his range wasn't the widest, um, quite possibly helped in in terms of the decision making. Say right, okay, so when we do it, who's going to be the one that does that sort of kind of you know flat counterpoint melody? Hmm, George, that seems to work for you because actually. The, the melody itself does range an awful lot more than perhaps he would have been able to manage. So it works. And you also wonder, I wonder if, you know, in regards to perhaps why George, that McCartney's voice is too melodic and that maybe it wouldn't have had the same urgency, the same intensity if it had been, you know, Maca Thumbsaloft rather than, than mopey old George. Yeah, absolutely. And with the, the, the I mean, that, I think that range thing is an interesting point as well, because um, that, 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 um, I'm certainly going to have to do it. So I apologize to everybody in advance. When, when Lennon has to do the, you really got a hoot, and it goes oh, up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, which is a really, a, and to, to the falsetto, he does a really good job. Lennon on on holding that, but again, it's contrasted against against Harrison's voice, and it's fa- it's just a really it happens a couple of times in the song, and it's really kind of effective moment that he that, that they're able to deliver on. Now, I don't think at this point in his career Harrison could have taken the lead on this because there's no way he would have been able to hit those kind of notes. But it's kind of a testament to Lennon that he's kind of preserving that from the original as well. You know, again, that's it, it's not necessarily something which needs to remain in it. Like if your voice couldn't reach it, you could just sing it in the same in the same range and that would be fine but it does add that extra bit of drama to it you know it does push the song into a uh, you know a slightly different emotional territory and it, it really works um, i think the vocal arrangements here are, are really genuinely very impressive yeah absolutely and and you know smoky robinson was clearly a huge inspiration there's there's an anecdote on you know one of these uh, sort of sources i was looking at that when recording um double fantasy I don't know if you you read about this, that at one point, I think they were recording uh, Woman and Yoko Ono um, told George that he sounded like um, he sounded like a beetle. Um, And, you know, his retort was along the lines of actually, no, I was trying to sound like Smokey Robinson. So, you know, that that legacy kind of lingered that that influence from from, you know, earlier days. Um, and, And you get a sense of that from, you know, again, from all of the cover songs. You know, it's either show tunes or it's Black American artists, isn't it? There's there's not really much that's that's coming from elsewhere, is there? It's you know, it's it's those kind of like diverse elements of it. I mean, it wouldn't have been su- much of a surprise if the Beatles had ended up doing um, um, "You'll Never Walk Alone" instead of "Jerry and the Pacemakers." <laughs> kind of thing you can imagine that George Martin probably had the conversation with them about. Um, 
so but these these are you know genuine influences genuine things that perhaps that they felt like they had discovered now whether there's that link to um you know the the docks liverpool that's the cliche isn't it that they've just had access to all these records um you know off the ships but there's there's something there that grabbed them that they weren't getting from music elsewhere um and i think that's that's a really important thing and, and these were songs that didn't really have much of a market of their own over here. So there's there's a point at which um, I'm sort of just formulating a wild kind of theory, um, you know, in my head at the moment. You know, we could potentially, and I know because we have, hey folks, we have to kind of discuss this off air. You know, you could have the cultural appropriation conversation, but actually there's there's an element to which you could make a case and saying that the Beatles helped advance um, an audience for this kind of music through performing it in a way that isn't needed these days because there are so many more outlets for it. Let's face it, you know, we're talking about a time obviously before Radio 1, before Pirate Radio, when people might only hear one or two of these songs on the radio um, during the course of a day because there was effectively a, you know, a quota to how many of these songs could get over. It was changing, of course but it was still relatively limited. So where were you going to hear this music if there wasn't someone there to play it for you, if you didn't then have someone who'd travelled or had been influenced by someone who'd been influenced by someone who'd been influenced by someone? So, you know, it's it's an interesting area, and I'm sure we will probably find some people who've, who've written about it and talked about it, but, you know, sometimes perhaps there was a need for people to advance the cause as it were or okay that got a bit kind of a bit cloying at the end there but i think the point stands somewhere in there there's a good point yeah no I, I i think you're right and i think one of the ways that the um cultural conversation has kind of moved on is that um like you you talked about uh, sort of cultural appropriation and the idea that um that you know you know black people's music being performed by white people you know is is necessarily going to feed into that but but yeah i mean i think that i think what's really obvious and i think this is i mean you know talking about you know chuck berry a couple of songs ago um but i think it, even although that wasn't necessarily our, our favorite song ever um i think you can still tell that it comes from a genuine place of love and affection for this kind of music i mean when uh you really got hold of me was released in the uk it was a flop it, it didn't sell you know which seems astonishing but that kind of music just just didn't shift that's also I true got... of, of virtually every other um you know cover that we've mentioned yeah 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 would have been a release and even some of the some of the artists uh themselves wouldn't have had very many hits over here um you know even after um the beatles had been um, you know, um, trumpeting them. Um, so, but then I think that says a lot for the cultural landscape at the time and, and how difficult it was perhaps to make the breakthrough beyond certain key. But you're always going to need some sort of, um, um, oh, what's the expression I'm looking for here? Um, some people who, who perhaps make the breakthrough, inf I would say influencers, because that has a different gen um, um, meaning really in this generation. Someone who's at the vanguard. Yeah, if you like. Yeah, yeah. You know, some people who are effectively mediating um, and recommending and, and, and pushing on. You know, it happens. Um, yeah. So I mean, I, I think the cultural context is also uh, interesting when it comes to discussing the difference between sort of English or British, I suppose, and American uh, as well. Because, I mean, you know, when we're talking about um, things like cultural appropriation, obviously Elvis is somebody that should come up as well. And the idea that, you know, he is basically a white guy performing black music. I mean, that's basically his entire career. And that cultural conversation has a very different resonance when you're talking about somebody who was, you know, contemporaneous with, say, Chuck Berry or, you know, somebody like that, as opposed to the Beatles, who are, you know, even although it's only maybe six or seven years later, it's still later. A lot of that kind of initial flair from rock and roll kind of died out like a lot of the uh, you know jerry lee lewis wasn't really doing anything by 1961 1962 um you know elvis in the army you know chuck berry there was scandals left right and center 
you know, all this kind of stuff, um, you know, and, and that cultural conversation, so much of that kind of initial burst of energy that came from rock and roll had kind of dissipated. Whereas um, when you have Elvis, who, are, who is contemporaneous with a lot of the black artists who were basically complaining about his kind of appropriation of their material, um, and you contrast it to the Beatles, who both come from a different culture and a completely different cultural context it does make things resonate in a different way i'm talking about um you know uh you really got a hold on me i mean this song is only a year old by the time the beatles are recording it and that makes a huge difference as well it is it, it's a contemporary song but one that didn't make any kind of impact in the uk at all so yeah there's the, the, the that whole cultural resonance uh, and cultural appropriation uh conversation really takes a different tone when you when you start to yeah compare like like elvis there's, um, and, you know, full disclosure, we've we've got, um, you know, two middle-aged, middle-class white guys sitting here talking about this. So, <laughs> you know. That's us. Yeah. Um, but there's the, okay, I'm going to make a comparison that I think very few people have ever made before. Okay. Excellent. So the, from from our, sorry, our, our lifetime or from when we were growing up and being influenced, the, the example I will give you uh, as a point of comparison is okay wait for it uh you be 40 oh. okay right so I mean, you be really? 40, <laughs> 40 you know fair enough not massive fan of 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 what they do although you know anyway no, let's not get into that um yeah. but they often get criticism for covering black artists and making money out of it but their argument um as, as I, I understand it and, and at several points has been, okay, that's fine, but we, you know, we pay good royalties to those original songwriters. And th as a result, you know, the original artists, the original songwriters make a lot of money out of it, perhaps more money than they may ever have made. And they are raising awareness of, you know, um, of various songs and various artists that would otherwise have gone unnoticed. So, you know, how you respond to that, entirely up to you whether you respond to that on the basis of the fact that it's literally 40 or um it's um you know whether it's a good or bad argument again listeners that's that's for you to decide but you know there is a point at which you can't actually make this audience go and listen to this stuff you kind of sometimes have to bring it to them um because let's face it a lot of people like listening to what they like listening to and listening to something new or change if you might maybe don't mind is um is is unsettling for for people difference is unsettling for people so um you know it's it's it, i don't necessarily think it's a bad thing uh, you know um i wouldn't necessarily be overly in favor of a band coming out and starting to do that today because i think actually they would should be aware that times have changed but um you know, I, I think there's there's definitely an argument that can be made, and I realise that I'm rambling now. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to slightly change this because, um, you know, I've sort of posited the fact that at some point we need to have a conversation about all of the best Beatle cover. But actually, do you know what? In my mind, this is it's one of my favourite cover versions, and in particular, it's because it's just buried away on on an album. You know, it's not like they make um you know a big song and dance of it and, and put it out as a single. I don't think they ever probably really would have put a cover out as a single. Um, but, you know, there are various websites who like to collate the best cover versions ever. And I, I think that's a bit of a bit of a dodgy area because quite a lot of the songs that might get mentioned on there are obscure songs. And, and I think if you're going to have a conversation like that, then, you know, you really need to be um, discussing songs that are well-known already or certainly by well-known artists um and, and i'm just gonna i'm gonna chuck three at you one of which i think also links in quite nicely with the conversation we've just been having uh which is uh, the talking heads cover of um uh, take me to the river now i don't yes. think that's better than the al green version because you know it's al green um, <laughs> but i think it's worth mentioning at this point that it was um a cover version that was hugely successful for them and gave them impetus at a time when perhaps they really needed it despite the fact it's one of the you know least successful songs on the album more songs about building in food it's still a good it's a good cover version but um so two more i'm going to give you one 
um, well, two both both artists have already been mentioned. Well, one's obvious when you you hear it in a, in a minute, but um, Pet Shop Boys always on my mind. Yep, that was exactly that was exactly the one I was going to yeah. mention as well. <laughs> and I and I genuinely believe it is superior to the Elvis version oh, God, in every yeah. single way. I mean, it's it's phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and it, that one and actually another. Um, Elvis cover, not a little less conversation, although I can see the merit in that argument as well. You know, it, it hits that that sort of you know mid early mid eighties sweet point. Um, and the other one, of course, would be Fine Young Cannibals, Suspicious Minds, uh, which really really works. But the other one that I was going to mention was um, was quite a straightforward one. Um, it's it's Joe Cocker, with a little help from my friends. Yeah, now you see, this is this is very much where our opinions diverge because I do not like Joe Cocker's version of a little bit, uh, a little help with my friends. Not one bit do I like it, and I know that's a conversation, potentially podcast-ending conversation that we're going to have to have when we roll round to Sergeant Pepper. But uh, yeah, I you see, I can't stand Joe Cocker's version. I understand the merits of it in an academic sense, but um, <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. It, it, it does all the things a good cover version should do. Let me say it that way. It, it, it reinterprets the song. It does something different with it. It's And that's exactly what Pet Shop Boys did with, with Always On My Mind, for example. Um, you know, and, and, you know, it gives it a completely different angle, different emphasis, different, different sort of form. So it, it does do that. But I won't go, I won't go into too much detail in that for the time because I'm, that's a conversation we'll be having in a year or two. Um, Is it linked to the Wonder Years by any chance? <laughs> it's not, funnily enough. No, 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 I just really don't like it. Um, anyway, that's a separate question. Now, um, yeah, I mean, when it comes to, like, really great cover versions, it is, I mean, it is a challenge. And one of the things about uh, You Really Got a Hold On Me is it is a very, very heavily covered song. Hundreds and hundreds of artists have covered it. But it's also one where there are hundreds and hundreds of really terrible cover versions as well. And from artists that you wouldn't necessarily expect to struggle with this kind of material. Like I said, the, the, the Percy Sledge version is basically just a carbon copy of the Miracles version. It, it's not yeah. bad as such. It, it's just it's just the same. There's, there's no real reason for it to exist. A um, couple of other ones which were worth listening oh, I say worth listening to, uh, worth acknowledging the existence of might be closer to the truth. Uh, Dusty Springfield does a version of this, which is really, really bad. Um, right. It just it, it's later. I think it's like early eighties. I think it's when her career was in the doldrums. So it's 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 all cheesy synth productions, and it's it's really it's it's not it's not really it's really not good um it's it's quite bad um and michael jackson did a version of it as well which is just execrable it's so bad um and you know i think it's fair to say that that michael jackson has one or two decent cover versions to his name that is not one of them it's just awful and um you know the idea that you know like we said it's not a complicated lyric it's not a complicated piece of music in terms of the way that it's written um most of the chords in it are uh sevenths um but there's the, it's like half a dozen chords like anybody who's been playing guitar for about three months can probably play it without really having to pause for breath it's a pretty simple music song so you wouldn't think those kind of artists would be ones that would struggle with it and yet and yet uh, they, they they do so there there is something in the song uh, 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 I don't know an irreducible quality to it which is is very easy to overlook most of the I listened to about ten or twelve different cover versions before we uh I've done, I've done my due diligence on this one and almost all of them are either mediocre or bad it's very rare that you come across a cover version of this particular song which is good which makes me appreciate the Beatles version even more than I did already I mean I do think this is a f phenomenal cover version but but the fact that there are so many really well established artists who just don't get it right helps to reinforce just what a good job they did with it it's quite playful isn't it I think that's that's one of the things for me I was sort of thinking about um um Obviously, obviously, I was listening. Promise you can, you can, you know, ask me anything about what you just said. But I was also thinking about, you know, other things that I would want to mention about this, and 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 so much of it hits sweet spots for me in that that sense of you know um, rhythm and the fact that we, we you know we we get slower parts, we get you know we kind of grind to a halt at one stage, you know, with just like the the vocals with the you know the um, um, hold me 
please, you know, and before we, you know, slowing down entirely, um, you just hold me, hold me, hold me. Piano kicks in again. You know I love a good pause. It, so it really kind of works for me. Um, you know, so it, it goes somewhere. It's not just the same thing repeated in a slightly different way. There's there's variety, there's this thought, there's drama, um, you know, there's there's depth to it in, in that way. That I think it's quite important. Um worth worth mentioning George Martin on piano on yes. this one as well. A really, really terrific piece of piano work from George Martin. Yeah. And I I gather um it was the first song that they recorded for the album as well. Oh, okay. Which was uh, um quite interesting that they you know they did several takes, only a few of which were really usable, and then they did some some you know edits. But it's another one that they returned to a couple of times, which you know for for songs they don't care about seems to be unusual. For work songs, once they've got a workable one, that's it, done in the can, never playing it again. But they did come back to it, even apparently after they then got hold of a four track um, that John Lennon insisted on them. them you know, having another go because he thought that that would make the difference in terms of improving the quality of the recording. Turns out he was wrong, but that's not the point. Um, so it's it's something that they cared about, and they cared about enough to include it a lot in their live set in the second half of, of 1963. Come the middle of December, it disappears again. But, you know, there are lots of occasions throughout 1963 where they were playing it. And and the thing that occurs to me that, that we haven't really discussed before with regards to their, their live sets is that they only really played 10 songs. You know, so when a song makes it into the set and sticks in the set for a period of time, there is significance to it. And there's a reason why some songs never get played. They're just album tracks. That's it. Job done. Um, so it had something. It meant something to them. And I'd even then sort of develop that by looking at the fact that it did return in the um when they got to Savile Row during the Let It Be sessions that that you can find um clips of them playing a couple of versions of it. Um and you know when Billy Preston is there, um not sure from the one that's got, got video, I'm not actually sure he's playing on it. Um because McCartney's on on the piano, Billy Preston sort of behind him um with his organ. But he doesn't look, it looks like he's just sort of sitting back and, and watching. Um, and, you know, it's slow, it's bluesy, it's got a almost like a slightly drunk feel to it. But, you know, only in that, that sort of sense that there's a little bit uh, of different emotion in there, you know, almost a, a, a sort of a, a regret that they're kind of they're playing this. Perhaps it doesn't have the same oomph that it had before. It has something else, but it doesn't have that same oomph. So it's interesting. There's 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 a lot to this song um, that I think you know you could probably spend a lot longer than we we've got the tolerance to um, you know talking about it. But um, yeah, so there's 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 more to investigate. The other version um, that I heard that was recorded in the Let It Be sessions, I couldn't really hear the guitar in it. Um, you know, certainly from from the mix that was it didn't sound like there was much guitar. And it was a little bit messier. But importantly, both of them are virtually complete recordings of the songs. And, you know, as you'll know from, from watching um, Get Back, they seem to stop and start lots of um, songs. You know, a lot of these recordings that were put into Get Back are fragments before they get yeah. bored and then move on to something else. So there's something in it that really appealed to them. Yeah, I mean, it's worth mentioning that this is in Let It Be, the movie. Uh, the, the, that version is in Let It Be, even though it doesn't appear in, in Get Back. Um, and that also says something as well. I, I mean, to a certain extent, like you said, there's a lot of songs which are just breakdowns. And so maybe, oh, it's a complete song. Quick, grab it. It's a perfectly valid reason for it to be there as well. But, you know, you're right. I mean, it clearly it clearly means something. It clearly does have that, that resonance. And the musicianship in the recorded version, I do think, is worth sort of paying attention to as well and particularly you know what's coming next particularly Ringo Ringo is a substantially better drummer uh, than the Miracles now I'm not 100% clear who played drums on 
the miracles version because if if, if wiki is to be gone by uh, which of course as we know it, it, it's it's always right and never wrong um all the all the musicians in the miracles are are listed um and then other instruments is by the funk brothers now Marvin Gaye was a member of the Funk Brothers at this point. So it might be Marvin Gaye on drums, but he wasn't the only drummer. So I'm not a completely 100% confident in saying that. But whoever it is, Ringo's better. He's just a better drummer. He's got more emphasis, and particularly the uh, during the... I'm tired of... And then he's got one fill where he just goes around the toms and then one where he, he's a bit more staccato on it. And it's a really, it, again, it just really pushes the drama of the song. And it's just one of those moments where it's so easy to appreciate how good Ringo is because it's not a flashy moment. It's not a showing off moment, but it's exactly the moment that the song needs. And it's, th- I mean, I'm, I, again, I said I was a bit cautious about saying whether the Beatles version was better than the Miracles version. But on that, I have no question at all. There's no doubt in my mind that Ringo is a better drummer than whoever it is that's, that's playing on the Miracles version, whether it's whether it's Marvin Gaye or not. But it's it's such a great little moment and it adds so much to the song when it's just such a little moment. And and yeah, that kind of musicianship, it is one of the things that really marks the Beatles out. This song mattered to them. They paid attention to it. Um, and their performance is absolutely brimming with that. I'm, I'm having deja vu here. Um, with, I'm, I'm pretty sure we've, we've talked about Marvin Gaye's drumming um, in a previous episode, haven't we? But I can't yeah, remember we have. when. Was it with... with um, um, roll over Beethoven. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Okay, good. Right. Sorry, just wanted to make sure. Just suddenly had this song. Like, yeah. So. Yeah. No, we did. We did mention it before, and that's that's one of the reasons I looked it up this time is because because when we've spoken about Motown before, I said, oh yeah, that was that was that was a point that came up. Yeah. I just had this horrible feeling that I'd I'd done some re- research uh, for this episode quite a while ago, and then completely and utterly forgotten it. But no, few. No. no, no, you're all good. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, apparently it wasn't uncommon for the Funk Brothers to be um, uncredited. So yeah, it's, it, um, it, it's quite hard to know, really, isn't it? But um, yeah, there you go. Yeah, it'd be, be nice to think that it was. Uh, I mean, Marvin Gaye was just a, a jobbing drum. It was the least um, developed skill in his repertoire. It was just so he could get into Motown that he did end up drumming because they needed a drummer. So that that might explain that so yeah, he, he played drums rather than he was a drummer maybe that's the way to say it no that that would be that would certainly be um a fair a fair summary yeah so yeah it's quite exhausting when you you talk about a song you actually like i mean not that there's, there's <laughs> that many people songs i don't like but sometimes it can be harder to draw the um to draw the fun and the enjoyment from it and you can sort of feel um you know, a, a bit like a session drummer going through the motions uh, from time to time. Um, yeah, checks notes. Right, it's going to be a while before we talk about Mr. Moonlight, so that's not too bad. No, but this album has been sort of fairly up and down in terms of its quality. So when you come across something like this, and like you mentioned, we've got an absolutely cracking cover version to come in a couple of episodes' time as well. You know, it does it does make a big difference. It, it, it the I, I think like you mentioned the playfulness of this song earlier on, and I think that is actually just something that's it's worth returning to, um, because a lot of the dud cover versions just play it so straight and serious, and it loses that sparkle. But there is a playfulness in this, this is a drama. There's the moments. There's the little the little bits. And although it's different to the Miracles version, the Miracles version has plenty of playfulness in it as well. It's slinky and it's it's kind of that weird. I think it's six eight time signature, which is just just really peculiar and unusual. And you know, there's lots of little playful moments in it. The stops, the starts, the all this kind of stuff. And and that that kind of infectious sort of joy in the playing, I think, just really does resonate in the Beatles version. It's it, it's it's really infectious and that enthusiasm i mean this is the longest episode we've recorded for quite some time but that that enthusiasm is one of the reasons for it i think you know it's it's such an easy song to get caught up in there's plenty going on there's so much to enjoy in it and yeah the, the fact that we've run so long on it just just kind of helps to prove that really it's it, it's interesting actually that, that when we're talking about you know this version better or this button, uh, version better of course what we've got are you know, two versions that were kind of snapshots of a moment in time where these guys were were recording 
you know, where technology was relatively similar, which helps, but then there wasn't necessarily the greatest emphasis on, on high quality um, recordings. Um, yeah, and I've got that Marvin Gaye, Marvin Gaye, oh, there we go. Got that Smokey uh, Robinson <laughs> um, live version that, that, that I've seen, which I think is just packs a real punch. Fantastic. I, I wish there was some recording of, of you know, good recording of a live version that, that the Beatles did. It would be lovely to know what this was like on stage, but that's obviously lost, um, you know, forever now. Yeah, um, you know, there's that sense that the recording is the song in that moment in time, but how they would have performed it many times could have been hugely different. Um, so, you know, we'll never know. But then I think that's just a sign of a really well-crafted song that when good people get hold of it in this way sorry dusty i'm not saying you're not good um then that actually something really powerful comes of it um although that said quite how i'm going to take that conversation on the next one when we've got um i want to be your man because you know, <laughs> okay crafted song and it's done okay by a couple of bands who've done lots of better work there you go that's that's the next episode done well, that's fair. Well, thank you, thank you for a little teaser there. That's that. That's glorious. I think. Um... And actually, and um, just one more thing. You, 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 we've both now referred to the fact that in a few weeks, a uh, few weeks time, a few episodes time, we've got another really cracking cover uh, coming up on this album. But that's not the best cover of that song. There you go. Oh, now, now I think I know what you're referring to, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say anything else until we get to that point uh, in 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 our run through. So um, yeah, I think we can we can probably draw a veil over this one for the time being and give this a score. So what do you fancy for this one? Oh oh, good blimey, Governor. Um, you know, at that point, what I really should do is bring up the old spreadsheet and uh, and and have a look and see um, what I'm going to compare it to. So. While I'm doing that, why don't you tell me what you think? Well, that's fine. I shall do that very thing indeed. I, I really enjoy this song. I, I'm kind of, I think, ooh, I'm hovering between a sort of eight and a half and a nine in this one. It's, it's, ah, mm, let me see. What did I give, what have I given eight and a half to so far or more yet? Yeah, please me was an eight. Um, is this well? I don't know. Maybe I should go for an eight because I don't know if this is the best song we've covered so far, but it's really good. Um, ah, oh, bugger, I'm going for an eight and a half. That's what I'm going to go for. I'm going to go for an eight and a half. That's fair enough. Um, I'm let's see now. See, I, I mean, I go boy seven, which is quite interesting. <laughs> Um, you know, three, great song. Me, seven, twist and shout, seven, from me to you, seven. The only eights I've given so far is she loves you and all my loving. Well, you know, sometimes you just got to go out on a limb, and I, I will put it as the equal of she loves you and all my loving at this moment in time. I may go back in and change that. That's fine. You know, how I feel about songs often changes from from day to day, but at the moment, yeah. I'll okay. say, it, um, of all the ones we've had so far, it's in the top three Beatles songs. I think, I think we, we can, can, uh, we we can, can probably, probably draw a veil over things, things for the time, time being. You, you can contact, contact us by the following methods. methods. We are on email. We are Beatlesstuffology at gmail.com. We are on Twitter at Beatles underscore ology. And at that point, I should chip in and say that I'm responsible for the underwhelming Twitter presence that we've got at the moment. And, you know, hopefully... By the time this goes out, um, you would have seen slightly more development. So please do, um, you know, jump on the old twits and and, and and see if I've managed to engage the audience in a, in a better way. There you go. I've committed to it publicly now. Right. Well, we have that recorded. So, yeah, there's no escape for you now. Excellent stuff. <laughs> okay. um, you can also find uh, my, more of my writing at my blog, which is at www.jgmacquarie.scot. Please like, rate and review us on whatever podcatcher you're using so that more people can find the show. And please do whatever people do on Twitter to help with that as well, because I believe that's a thing. Next episode, we are going to be covering I Want to Be Your Man. And as always, we hope you're going to join us for it. But until then, keep listening.